Well, it happened. Old Booster 9 and Ship 25 over there finally completed what could be their last significant test ahead of Starship's second launch. At least, um, that's what we hope. Furthermore, Ship 26 was rolled back to the Rocket Garden, having seemingly completed testing. And finally, we've seen more indications pop up that we could be seeing Starship's second launch here very soon. Hey Tank Watchers, I'm Jack Beyer for NSF, and this is your Starbase Update. This video is sponsored by Novium. Let's start off the show with some existing hardware that we've been keeping our eye on for weeks now, the HLS Mock-Up Nose Cone, also known as NC21. Like we mentioned in last week's Starbase update, the HLS Nose Cone was moved from its previous storage position to a spot next to the Rocket Garden in a late night move. Based on labels, we know this Nose Cone is related to HLS construction and or testing, and I mean, just look at it, they painted it white. Update. While this script was being written, SpaceX began building what appears to be a stage next to the nose cone. This might mean an HLS presentation is coming. However, it's unclear if there will be any public event that will include media access or maybe a closed one that is only for NASA folks and VIP. Who knows, we've also seen workers assemble and then perplexingly disassemble a tent in this same area. So something appears to be going on and we'll keep our eyes out and let you know. Now let's move from the production site back over here to the launch site where we saw some more work done to the trench and wall that are being built next to the suborbital launch site. It seems like this work is to route the recently laid power lines under Highway 4 and over to the launch site. Well, work on the wall is, well, to finish work on the wall. It is a little sad to see this particular angle of Starbase get covered up with a higher wall, but that's the way it goes. Hopefully in the process of all this work, SpaceX will remove the suborbital tank farm grass vent because as we all know, it's meaningless. Adrian, um, Adrian made me say that, but I do agree. Speaking of the suborbital side of the launch site, let's talk about Ship 26. This ungainly prototype's time in the sun is seemingly coming to an end with its removal from suborbital pad B late at night this week. Shortly after that, it was placed on a transporter disconnected from the LR-11000 crane and transported back to the production site, where it arrived and moved to the Rocket Garden area. Only time will tell if it will have more work done to it or if it'll be scrapped, but at this point, Adrian, who wrote this script, and I are both thinking scrapping is the most likely scenario going forward, unless they find other ways to use Ship 26 for Pathfinder testing. And in case we haven't said it enough times, I'm sorry, Ship 26 lovers, but I don't think this one's gonna fly. Let's move back to the Rocket Garden area where the two booster CO2 tanks we've been keeping our eyes on are still hanging out next to the shipping and receiving area. But this week we saw some work done on them. As a reminder, these tanks are for the CO2 needed for the fire suppression system for the engine section of the booster. And as you can see, they're quite long. Each of these tanks is installed in one of two of the booster's four chines. That's the little stubby bits on the side. We also got some great photos that show their structure in detail. Now, they're not COPVs or composite overwrapped pressure vessels as they're not carbon and they're not overwrapped, but they fulfill a similar purpose as one of those small tanks. Their primary focus is to fix one of the main problems from the first flight, as the CO2 will be used to purge flammable gas from the engine bay of the booster, with a goal of preventing fire there from damaging Raptor engines and endangering the vehicle in flight. Still at the Rocket Garden, we have Ship 28 on the engine installation stand, and Ship 29 waiting to get its own turn on the stand for engine installation. But, of course, now we also have Ship 26 and the HLS nose cone, both mentioned a moment ago. Ship 28 could soon move to the launch site for static fire testing, and we're keeping a close eye on the scaffolding around the leeward side of the ship, which would presumably have to be dismantled before they lift Ship 28 off the engine installation stand and roll it out for, hopefully, static fire testing. Ship 28 is the expected flight candidate to follow Ship 25 after the second flight of Starship. Ship 28 already went through a considerable amount of testing and modifications and has had all six Raptors installed on it for some time now. So next up in its testing flow would, of course, be engine testing, such as spin prime, pre-burner, and static fire testing. 
Speaking of Raptors, we spotted three Raptor vac storage containers in the shipping and receiving area. But don't get too excited because it seems like these were probably empty and getting ready to be shipped back to McGregor or Hawthorne for the transport of more Raptor vacuum engines. Unless we're all just big dum-dums, and in fact these are three Raptor vacs just sitting there, perhaps going back to McGregor for testing. Either way, it's interesting to see these containers sitting out in the open. Not normal. Earlier in the week, these containers had been sitting outside the Raptor building, which is the small annex to the Mega Bay where we've spotted Raptors in the past. At some point, they were moved over to the shipping and receiving area, and that's why we expect them to be trucked away for another round of Raptor transport. Now let's move over to the production site and take a look at Mega Bay 2, where SpaceX is preparing to install glass on the upper part of the structure, as evidenced by the delivery of a large amount of glass panels to the production site this week. The top level of the Mega Bays are purported to host office space and other facilities, so outfitting them with large windows is a good idea and honestly quite a job perk. Rounding out the work at the production site this week, of course, work continued on the Star Factory building. A suspected second booster engine installation stand was rolled out from the Sanchez site to the production site late night at Friday, and a ship midlock section was rolled over to the high bay, presumably as the next piece of Ship 32 that will be stacked. All right, now let's talk about the regulatory process, the second launch of Starship, and the flight vehicles. But first, here's a quick word with our sponsor. To me, weightlessness is one of the absolute coolest parts about spaceflight and personally one of the things i'd most like to experience with today's sponsor novium you me or anyone can put a little space on your desk novium hover pens are inspired by space and are a great and artful way to have a little reminder of the coolness of weightlessness in your workspace i don't know about you but i like to have things on my desk or in my work area that inspire my creativity and my curiosity and of course that make my brain happy Hover pens are high-end pens that not only look awesome, but provide an excellent writing experience, especially as we enter the holiday season. But really year-round, a hover pen is a unique and timeless gift idea for yourself or someone you care about. The Interstellar Edition has a tilt of 23.5 degrees, which is reminiscent of the Earth's tilt on its axis of rotation. It's available in several great colors like Space Black and Mars Magma. Plus, there are premium editions made with 18 karat gold, and they even have a real meteorite embedded in them. I personally really like the Future Edition, which has an interchangeable tip, so you can switch back and forth between a rollerball or a fountain pen, depending on whatever you feel like at the time. I mean, just, just look at that pen spin! How cool is that? Use code NSF to get 10% off and free shipping. And use the link in the description so Novium knows that we sent you. Thanks again to Novium for sponsoring this video, and of course, for making a cool product. Early on Tuesday, we got some exciting indications that SpaceX was going to conduct a full wet dress rehearsal with Ship 25 and Booster 9. Or, as SpaceX called it in a subsequent tweet posted after the test, a quote, flight-like rehearsal ahead of launch. The production site remained empty at the beginning of the 6 a.m. shift, which is usually a very good sign, as leaving the production site empty is a fairly uncommon thing for SpaceX to do. Another promising sign was when Adrian called the port of Brownsville, great job, Adrian, and confirmed that the previously issued MSIB, or Marine Safety Information Bulletin, was in fact still valid. So a full wet dress rehearsal, as previously hinted by SpaceX, was indeed possible. The chopsticks then partially opened, not going into a full launch position, but at least no longer bearing the weight of the stack during the test. We then saw a multi-hour preconditioning of the tank farm before SpaceX started to load propellant into the stack. Methane and liquid oxygen were loaded, as well as CO2, into the purge tanks we talked about earlier. These tests are some of my very favorite because it's just so cool to see a vehicle come to life as the vents start venting and the booster and ship get frosty and the ground systems do all of their work. It's just awesome. By the way, if you have any questions about the wet dress rehearsal, why it's needed, what it is, all of that, we released a video about it this week. Check it out. We'll put the link in the description. Once the test got close to the T0, the FireX system that suppresses the accumulation of flammable gases under and around the orbital launch mount occurred. We presume this meant that the simulated countdown was over as, in a wet dress rehearsal, SpaceX does not actually take the vehicle all the way to engine ignition. About 5,000 tons of propellant were loaded on the vehicles. That's 10 million pounds. That's insane. After the FireX test, detanking began and propellant was removed from the vehicle so that it could be safe for crews to return to the pad and continue working there. 
But it wasn't over till it was over. Once everything was close to detanked, we saw a test of the water deluge system, which seemed significantly more robust in terms of both duration and volume of water used, especially compared to the initial tests of the system when it was first activated. So, in summary, SpaceX used the wet dress rehearsal day to test all of the systems they could in order to get this booster and ship ready for flight. That's a very good sign. So in summary, SpaceX used the wet dress rehearsal day to test all of the systems they could in order to get Booster 9 and Ship 25 ready for flight. That's a very good sign. SpaceX then confirmed with a tweet, including some gorgeous drone shots, saying Starship and Super Heavy were loaded with, once again, more than 10 million pounds of propellant in a flight-like rehearsal ahead of launch. They followed this tweet up with, quote, the vehicle is ready for the second test flight of a fully integrated Starship, pending regulatory approval. On the regulatory front, SpaceX is still waiting for approval from the FAA, which is in consultation with the Fish and Wildlife Service about the use of the deluge system for Starship Flight 2. Speaking of the fish people, as Chris B. lovingly calls them, the Fish and Wildlife Service provided an updated statement this week, saying that the agency started the consultation with the FAA on October 19th, and from there on out, now has 135 days for the amended biological opinion. Thankfully, they pointed out in this same statement that they don't expect to take all of that time. We've seen the Fish and Wildlife Service people walking around and working in Boca Chica since then, apparently cleaning up debris in the wetland and next to the launch site. I can't help but wonder if they're doing any work to study the effects of the deluge system as well, since they were spotted on site both before and after the wet dress rehearsal and aforementioned deluge test. But the regulatory news doesn't stop there. An updated notice to mariners was published for the Gulf of Mexico, indicating hazardous space operations. The window is on November 6th, between 5.25 a.m. and 11.15 a.m. Now, this isn't a reason to book a flight quite yet, but it is promising. As a reminder, DOS did an excellent video on how to read the tea leaves about all of the different things that we expect to see leading up to launch. So if you want to know how to divine what's going on, watch that video if you haven't already. Again, links will be in the description. You know how this works. It's YouTube. All of these signs, however, are good news that things are moving forward and in the right direction. Finally, another helpful sign that we could see flight too soon is the scheduling of the NASA WB-57 aircraft from November 3rd to November 11th on a, quote, domestic operation. Now, this could be unrelated to Starship, or it could be totally related. It's just another data point we have as we edge ever closer to launch that I figured I should mention. Anyways, moving back to the wet dress rehearsal, after everything was detanked and the test was over, the road was open, crews came back out to the launch pad, and the dance floor, aka the work platform, was raised back up under the booster so that inspections could be done. Then on Thursday, the vehicle was destacked. The expectation at this point is that this is the final destack before flight, as a final destack is necessary so crews can arm the ship's flight termination system. We have our cameras trained on Ship 25, and we will likely catch them as soon as they move to that area and start this work, so stay tuned. On Friday, the hot staging ring was also removed, which at this point is most likely to access the flight computers, grid fin motors, and forward bulkhead of Booster 9. No big deal, as it doesn't take a lot of time to replace the ring, maybe a couple hours tops. In fact, just before I recorded this video, that's exactly what they did. They replaced the ring. So once again, hot stage ring and booster are one. At this point, the items needed for Starship Flight 2 are being checked off the list one by one. And we're doing everything we can here at NSF to ensure we bring you the best views possible for Starship Flight 2. Thanks to Novium for sponsoring this video. Links in the description. Thanks for watching, and as always, be excellent to each other.